Welcome back, guys, to episode 54 of the JPS podcast. And in today's episode, we are going to go through a Q&A session with yours truly. And I'm going to be answering some of the questions that were posted uh, to our Q&A forum on Instagram. And I've categorized these questions into nutrition, training, and career-related questions. And I'm going to be running through my answers to those. So I hope you guys enjoy this Q&A session. We're going to be running one of these each month. So if you aren't already following me on Instagram, head over and do so, so that you can have your questions answered. Follow me at Jacob Skepis, S-C-H-E-P-I-S underscore J-P-S. You can post your questions and I'll answer them for you here. So before we get into things, a few shameless plugs. First up, the online mentorship course is fast approaching and is open for enrollment. So if you guys haven't heard, I have designed a 12-week course for coaches and self-coaches to help take their knowledge and understanding of the science and practice of getting results to a whole new level. So we have enlisted industry experts from the fields of sports and exercise science, nutritional sciences, physiotherapy and psychology, as well as a number of leading strength and physique coaches to provide a truly evidence-based learning experience. The course contains 12 modules with over 40 presentations from the likes of Mike Isratel, James Krieger, Danny Lennon, Brian Miner, Steve Hall, and yours truly. You can enroll and secure your position in the course for just 250 Australian dollars, and you can pay the remainder of the course via installments when the course starts in February 2019. We also have the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference coming up in June 2019. We already have our 10 presenters confirmed, the venue secured, and all systems go. So we have Mike Isratel back for another installment of what I'm sure will be an extremely entertaining presentation. We have Eric Helms, Brian Miner, Danny Lennon, James Hoffman, and Gabrielle Fundaro from Renaissance Privatization, and the one and only Martin McDonald. So the conference is going to be held in Melbourne at the Mecca of Event Centres in Australia, the Melbourne Convention Centre, in June the 28th to the 30th. So the conference is three days long. It's going to be jam-packed and early bird tickets are now available. You can grab yours and secure your position uh, in the description box below. Finally, our online coaching stream is fast filling up and we are finalizing our coaching rosters at JPS for 2019. So if you're looking for a coach and someone to help guide you with your training and nutrition, you're simply in a rut, you might be stalling with your fat loss, you may have plateaued with your muscle gain or strength building efforts, then we can help. Our coaches will devise an individualized program and diet specifically tailored to you based on a questionnaire and a consultation that we'll have with you before you start and we can help keep you accountable along the way with weekly check-ins, monthly Skype calls and help navigate you towards your goals. Again, you can check out more information or submit an application uh, in the description box below. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the questions and first up we have some nutrition related questions. So the first question from Patty is what is the main difference between a calorie deficit and then reverse dieting post deficit to get to maintenance or going straight to maintenance? So I think there's a lot of confusion around reverse dieting and what it actually is. So we're going to start with what maintenance is. So maintenance is obviously energy equilibrium and it's going to result in no further weight loss simply because we're not at a calorie deficit. Now maintenance calories is a highly dynamic and moving target. It's not going to be the same every day. For example, you might have a day where you rack up 15,000 steps, you're going to expend a lot more energy and then you might have days where you only have 5,000 steps and you're going to have significantly lower maintenance calories. Now, although that is true, we can estimate our maintenance calories uh, based on our rate of loss and things like that. We can use calculators or simply just tracking our intake. But a reverse diet, we need to remember that as we reverse diet, we're still at a calorie deficit. We're not at maintenance. So we're going to see further weight loss. Uh, We're just slowing down that rate of loss. Now, a reverse diet can be useful when your target weight hasn't been reached because obviously we're still going to lose fat, but we're just slowing down the rate of loss. So as you get leaner and leaner, it's really advisable to make a smaller deficit day to day and over the week so that we don't risk losing muscle and we don't bring about all of the adaptations uh, that come with aggressive dieting uh, when we're lean because it's not a good idea for obvious reasons. 
Uh, obviously, the increase in calorie intake has a number of benefits as we start to stepwise uh, increase our calorie intake out of the deficit uh, because it's going to fill out glycogen, which can improve uh, performance. We'll obviously see some increase uh, in our needs. Our hunger will decrease, mood will improve, all of these sorts of things, which is really, really beneficial uh, for anyone, really. And most importantly, if we reverse out of a deficit, uh, we can still lose weight, obviously, but we can also minimize the post-diet uh, rebound or blowouts. And this is really important. So something I like to do with a lot of my clients is we'll set a 10-week dieting phase the first five weeks might be uh, pretty assertive and aggressive with a larger deficit. And after that five weeks, once they've bought in to me, they're consistent, they're motivated with the results they're getting, I will start to increase their calorie intake and reverse them out. Uh, they're still going to be at a deficit. We just slow down that rate of loss. And this has a number of benefits and can often lead to even more weight loss uh, if they're holding water because we know that uh, increasing calories, reducing the size of the deficit will uh, lower stress. And we know that carbohydrates have a somewhat therapeutic effect on cortisol, which can allow for any retained water to subside and we start to look visually better, which is extremely important. So neither is better or worse. Uh, I think definitely if you've reached your target weight, uh, then go straight to maintenance. But if you're not quite there yet, uh, reverse dieting out is definitely something I would recommend trialing. Uh, you've got to do it with the right type of clientele, provided that they're adhering and they're not uh, really, really fatigued from the diet. Uh, because again, when you reverse, you're still at a deficit and it's only going to prolong the dieting phase. But a great question, Patty, and I hope I answered that one for you. Second question. Constant low versus high days, week by week to maintain weight. And again, this was from Patty. And what she's referring to here is uh, when we're trying to maintain, should we have days where we have lower calorie intakes and higher calorie intakes? And I think there's a few factors that uh, should influence how we structure our weekly uh, calorie intake and how we distribute that uh, intake across each day. And number one is personal preference and lifestyle. So some individuals will prefer undulating intakes, so they're going to have days where they prefer to eat more food or they're simply going to be exposed to more food, such as on the weekends. And it might be really useful to have higher calorie intakes on those days um, and potentially at a deficit one or two days during the week um, because they're going to adhere and it's just going to make things a little more enjoyable for them. The second thing to consider is somebody's lifestyle. So a lot of people will uh, require a set number of days uh, with pretty consistent intake simply because they don't want to be thinking about you know changing their intake or having to worry about micromanaging their food or making too many adjustments because they've got so many other things going on in their life really busy they might be highly stressed so keeping it simple for individuals who are extremely busy um, and just having a set uh, calorie intake across the week without any undulation uh, is probably advisable. But again, some people do like keeping things exciting and challenging and you know, carb cycling is somewhat uh, attractive for them. So it can be useful. Whatever the client prefers and what their lifestyle is suggesting will be best for them is always gonna dictate how we set things up. Now, the final consideration I will have is whether the client uh, has some performance related goals. So if training performance is a huge priority, there may be benefits in allocating uh, greater intakes and carb intakes around their training days to obviously support performance and recovery. Um, and then you can just have lower days on their rest days and things like that, making sure that obviously the weekly uh, caloric intake is at maintenance uh, so they do maintain. But again, take those things into consideration and it's always going to be dependent on the individual, but a few things to consider there. I hope I yeah, gave you a sufficient answer on that one, Patty. Question number three is from Will, and Will asks, can you discuss when to adjust macros and calories in a fat loss phase when one may think they have plateaued and the mindset that comes along with that? What variables should we look out for before making these adjustments and how big or small should they be? Will. So I think it's first important to address what a true stall is. In the context of fat loss, Scale weight is only one metric. We need to look at a number of factors uh, before we 
can say that somebody has truly stalled. So obviously adherence is number one. We need to make sure that the client is actually adhering uh, to their diet and as a rule of thumb, adherence needs to be 100% for at least 10 to 14 days uh, you know, without any changes in any of the following variables before we make an adjustment. And the variables we need to be looking at are obviously scale weight. We need to also be considering uh, their girth measurements, progress photos, so how they're looking in the mirror, as well as their clothing. And these are the four big ones that I use with my clients. Now, if after 10 to 14 days of 100% adherence, none of these metrics are really showing uh, any progress, then it may be time to make an adjustment. Now, we also need to take into account a couple of other things, which is the time frame. So how long does somebody have to reach their goal? For example, if I have a contest prep athlete who is under very, very strict uh, constraints in terms of time, then we don't, we can't afford to have another week just hoping and waiting to see if we get some movement on the scale. Uh, we might need to be a little more assertive and step in and make an adjustment. If somebody has, on the other hand, six months, 12 months to achieve this goal, they're in no real rush. They might be someone who's just looking to lean up and feel better in their clothes, uh, you know, long term, or they're an obese client uh, who's got a lot of dieting ahead of them, then there's no need to rush things and put the foot on the gas to try to speed it up. Uh, you want to make sure that you're 100% certain that they've stalled and ensure that you're not uh, just making an adjustment for the sake of it. That being said, it's really important also to consider how many calories uh, the client is currently consuming and how much cardio they're doing. So if somebody's already uh, dieted down there on really low calories, reducing calories any further may not be feasible. So you might need to take a diet break. You might need to increase their calories uh, you know, for a few days, two to three days, give them an extended refeed, or potentially go to a maintenance phase and just try to hold their new weight, uh, assuming they've lost a decent amount of weight uh, for a couple of weeks or months uh, before resuming the diet phase simply because it's not practical to have somebody diet on 800 calories and it's probably going to do more harm than good. Same goes if their cardio is already jacked up, they're doing you know hours each day and they're on low calories or they're getting towards those lower end of the calories. Again, it might be worth just pulling back, reshifting the focus for a little bit, dropping some fatigue and then getting them into a better place uh, with their calories and their cardio and their mindset uh, before going ahead into another dieting phase. But if a client has stalled and it's a true stall, uh, everything's looking like it's not uh, progressing as it should be and they're not losing at the target rate of loss, uh, we want to make an adjustment. And in terms of adjustments, we only want to make as much of an adjustment as necessary to get them uh, losing at their target rate of loss. So the target rate of loss is typically going to be anywhere between 0.5 to 2% of body weight uh, per week, depending on how much body fat they have. So if I have an overweight client and I need them to be losing around 1% to 2% of body weight per week and they're stalled, I'll make an adjustment that will see them fall within that range. And typically that's going to be a bigger adjustment. It might be, say... 300 calories a day and again typically they'll be on higher calories so as a percentage of their total calorie intake it's not going to be that much however as somebody gets leaner and leaner and leaner the amount of calories uh, we reduce from their diet uh, each day or across the week will get smaller and smaller obviously because their target rate of loss uh, needs to be accounted for and they're going to be on lower intakes so uh, it's all relative to their total intake but as a rule of thumb, I will typically reduce uh, fat first, then carbohydrates, and then protein last as a, as a last resort. And if it gets to that point, unless it's a contest prep athlete, um, usually it's time to shift the focus and get out of the, the dieting phase. But again, uh, you want to make small changes. You don't want to make large overhauls, and you only want to manipulate one variable at a time so that you can uh, objectively assess and measure um, you know, whether or not it's effective. If you're changing too many things all at once, uh, you're not going to know which variable is causing the change, and that can only lead to more confusion and just less predictability uh, in terms of their progress. 
Speaking of predictability, uh, reducing calorie intake before adding cardio is always how I approach things simply because uh, cardio is very unpredictable because we have a number of things that occur when we uh, increase our cardio, especially if it's moderate to high intensities. We have things like the uh, compensatory effect. So basically when you increase activity levels uh, in a certain period of time, the body will compensate by reducing non-exercise activity thermogenesis in the periods after that, which can essentially negate uh, the caloric expenditure in that cardio session. And you also need to consider the substitution effect. So you might be burning 100 calories at rest over an hour. You might go and do uh, 200 calories worth of cardio. You don't just add that 200 calories uh, to your daily uh, energy expenditure because you already would have burned 100 calories if you didn't do that cardio, so you would only add 100, and that's the, the substitution effect. So you don't uh, substitute uh, the calories you would have otherwise expended with any cardio you introduce. So just some important considerations, but usually calorie reductions before we add cardio, um, and cardio will be added in once the calorie intake starts to get to uh, levels that are quite low and harder and harder to adhere to. But I hope I answered that question for you, Will. And yeah, brother, just be patient. Just be patient. That is the uh, most important thing to remember uh, when you're dieting for fat loss. Um, you know, you have to make sure that your ex expectations align with what's going to be realistic and sustainable uh, given your goals. And just make sure that you're looking to all the measurements when you're assessing progress and remembering that the scale is just one of those. Next question is from Angus, and he asks, what is your nutrition strategy with a client looking to lean down and has already been in a calorie deficit and plateaued? So really good question. This is very common for a lot of coaches out there. They'll have somebody who's been trying to diet for a long period of time. They're on low calories, um, and they're not losing weight. Usually, this is a case of misreporting, so the client's actually not eating the calories uh, that they're claiming to eat. So the first thing I like to do is a little audit. So I'll get them to take photos of all their food um, and then track their calories alongside that. And then I can have a pretty good assessment and understanding of whether the food they're eating aligns with the calories that they're tracking. And in many cases, uh, there's a large discrepancy. So they'll be under-reporting their calorie intake. So they might claim to be eating a thousand calories, uh, but they might be eating 1500 and hence uh, they've plateaued. So the first thing is to educate them as to what energy balance is, uh, how many calories are in the food that they're eating, how to track appropriately. And from there, we can start to uh, make an assessment as to whether or not we continue the diet or potentially uh, reverse diet, so increase their calories um, in a stepwise manner, so week to week, depending on uh, how much weight they're gaining, maintaining or losing, uh, or just try and find their maintenance calories immediately, so with a bigger increase in their calories straight away. But again, this takes uh, quite a bit of buy-in, and when somebody hires you, they want results initially, which can be uh, a very difficult process uh, to go through as a coach, because uh, you have somebody who's expecting results, they're paying you to get them results and get them leaner, and to lose weight, and you're trying to tell them something that's completely contrary to what they're hiring you for. But at the end of the day, there's no point flogging a dead horse. And if somebody is uh, already dieted down, they're very fatigued, they're plateaued, mentally burnt out uh, from dieting, you may need to uh, advise them to eat more food and just highlight the importance of having a long-term perspective when it comes to nutrition. You know, recognizing that dieting is something we do for life, and if we want to, you know, achieve our goal, our physiques and a healthy and uh, aesthetic-looking body composition, then we need to uh, really broaden our horizons and be open to the idea of eating more food at certain points in time because it makes. Uh, sure that we can diet uh, properly in those times where we dedicate uh, specific periods to uh, creating an energy deficit and getting leaner. But again, you need to consider the resistance uh, the client has when that you propose this idea to them uh, versus you know how receptive they are. And if somebody's receptive to it, then go for it straight away. Don't think twice. Get their calories up and get them to a point where they're healthy, they're feeling good and they're motivated to diet again. Hunger's low, uh, strength's through the roof, all that kind of stuff. But if they're resistant, you might need to 
work around that and try to tippy toe around things a little bit. But I hope I answered that one for you, Angus. Next question from Nick. How do we maximize gen pop clients buy-in with regards to diets? I really struggle to have clients fully commit to changing their diet. So this is a really good question. A lot of general population clients are very, very difficult uh, at the onset to help in terms of their nutrition simply because they often have a very misguided understanding of what constitutes uh, good quote unquote uh, nutrition. So the first point of call with a lot of my clients is to educate them. And most importantly, we need to recognize and respect that all of our clients are going to come to us with a very unique set of values, beliefs, and attitudes. And what they value, what they believe in, and you know their attitude towards nutrition is largely going to influence what they're motivated to do and what they're not motivated to do. And this has a downstream effect on their behavior, which in turn creates habituation. So I really like to strip things back, find out what this person values. What, does, what do they care about? Do they actually care about getting lean? Because if they don't value having a six pack, there's no point in trying to help them get a six pack. It's simply not something uh, that's gonna motivate them. Uh, they're not gonna change their behaviors accordingly. However, if they do value, you know, dieting down and getting a six pack, or you know, they value a certain, uh, you know, measurements or whatever the case may be, uh, then I need to assess what their beliefs are. So, what do they actually believe to be true about nutrition now? And this is very much like connecting dots. So, you'll have a lot of clients who will connect the dots of carbs and weight gain. So, you need to erase that. You need to get out your whiteboard marker, erase that line, and connect carbs to energy, and then energy to calorie deficit, calorie surplus, and then calorie surplus to weight gain, and so on and so forth. Um, and this can be really useful, and I often get my clients in front of a whiteboard, and I'll explain this uh, to them, so they then have a better understanding of what it is they need to do, and then I need to teach them the skills and the tools they need to employ daily and weekly, um, and the behaviors that they need to uh, perform so that they can achieve their goals. So it's really multifaceted, very complex. And when we talk about behavior modification, um, you know, in respect to buying, um, you know, it, it's very hard to get people to do things that uh, they're not motivated to do, which is quite common. So we need to make sure that we give them appropriate rewards. Um, obviously, there's a lot of delayed gratification involved in achieving, uh, you know, your goal physique and losing weight, things like this. But you know, you need to make sure that you give your clients the feedback um, and positive, you know, assurance once they have, you know, achieved a little milestone and things like that. And you also need to think about some of the constraints, uh, both the environmental as well as the psychological constraints uh, that can uh, inhibit their ability to perform a certain behavior. So again, addressing their home environment, their work environment, and just their mindset in general uh, is, is really, really important. And finally, you know, with respect to behaviors, you need to make sure that the person has uh, the skill and the education to perform the behavior. So telling somebody to track calories or to follow a meal plan or to cook certain meals if they don't have the skills to do so is going to be really, really difficult. So we need to make sure that we address that and pick it apart, make sure that the person knows uh, what they need to do and why, but then also how to do it and guide them along the way. So man, uh, buy-ins are a very, very difficult thing, highly individual dependent. Um, but again, you need to make sure that uh, the person's goals align with what they value um, and setting goals is really important. So making sure that they're smart goals, everyone knows what this is, but also making sure they're meaningful because this will be something that the person values, which means they're much more likely to be motivated to do that. So I hope that answered that, Nick, uh, but great question, man. Question number six. Is eating a maintenance calories on rest days during a bulk a smart way to minimize fat gain or are you cutting yourself short on gains? So this is a really good question. Again, similar to the previous question, whether or not she had have high or low days. But again, what's most important for uh, muscle gain and you know bulking is you know, we want to be building muscle. And the most potent stimulus for muscle growth is resistance training. The diet simply... Uh, attenuates uh, all the 
physiological uh, changes that we stimulate uh, in resistance training. So your calorie intake needs to be at minimum maintenance and a small surplus is usually advisable and how you allocate the calories across the week is going to make too much difference provided you're at a net surplus over the week. Um, but again, it will reduce the magnitude of the calorie surplus and thus minimize the rate of gain, which in my opinion is not an issue. And it's very much down to the individual preference, uh, whether or not they're likely uh, to gain fat or they are predisposed to you know, gaining more muscle than fat, uh, in which case I'd probably err more on the side of an assertive surplus if there's somebody who, you know, they're genetically a little more gifted, going to build a little bit more muscle, a bit easier than somebody who's going to build, uh, gain a little bit more fat and have a harder time building muscle. It might be wise to have maintenance days on their rest days for sure. Um, but again, just ensure that their rate of gain is consistent and quantifiable. Um, you know, having high and low days in a gaining phase can uh, make the scale weight measurements a little messy because we get transient changes in gut, gut mass, glycogen stores, and things like that. Um, but it's really up to the individual what they prefer and you know how quickly they need to be gaining uh, you know, based on their level of advancement genetics and things like that. So for sure, you can simply reduce the size of the surplus across the week to ensure total calories are the same. Uh, it will level out in the long run, but more often than not, simple is better. Now on to the training related questions and really good one here first up is from Nairi, one of our coaches at JBS. When will your biceps be half as big as mine? Screw you Nairi, I'm just going to take out all your direct arm work from your program now so I hope you're happy. And in all seriousness, Stephen asked a really good question. He's doing multiple sets with the same weight and reps effective enough for hypertrophy. He gives a few examples here. So in the first example, a 5x10 with increasing reps in reserve. Or the second example is a set and rep scheme of 15, 12, 9, 7, and 5 with a 1 uh, reps in reserve. Or a 3x10 where you drop weight uh, for 2x10, which is otherwise known as top sets and back offsets. And he asked me, which is my preferred method? So good question, Stephen. And I think the first... Thing to remember when we're discussing anything in relation to program design is more often than not there is no right or wrong. Uh, however, let's let's pick it apart and start with some of the prerequisites uh, for muscle growth in terms of how we devise a training program. And number one, we obviously need to make sure we have sufficient training vo volume, which is exposure to tension, and that typically means anywhere between ten to twenty sets per week and we need to have an appropriate intensity of effort, which is usually an RPE of six or more, or an RIR of four or more. And what's really uh, noteworthy in these kind of questions is that exercises will lend themselves better to certain loading and progression schemes. So there's nothing wrong with any of the above uh, rep and set schemes uh, or intensity of efforts because for the most part, assuming that total work done in the week, uh, you know, meets the criteria of you know ten to twenty sets, uh, technique is good, all those sorts of things, they they seem like they could definitely help build muscle. Um, but again, some exercises lend themselves better to different types of progression models. So, uh, in compound exercises like your squats, your bench press, and your deadlifts, where you're typically using more muscle groups and greater absolute loads, a single progression is really useful where we might set uh, you know, a intensity of effort pretty constant. For example, we want an RP of eight, and we might do a three by five, so a consistent uh, rep and set scheme, and we might just look to add weight week to week to week. Um, that's a great way to progress your compounds. And in some other compound movements that are using lower absolute loads, for example, your unilateral work or some of the, the machines, you might use uh, a double progression where you could uh, add reps first and then load and just trying to float within a certain uh, RPE zone. So, you know, with an increasing intensity of effort across the sets, definitely fine. Uh, but again, what you need to really consider is the total number of effective reps. And effective reps by definition is, you know, the reps where you're exerting uh, the most amount of force, recruiting the high threshold motor units. So typically when you're getting towards uh, an RPE of you know five or more, 
And if you contextualize training in that sense, uh, you know, having your RPEs uh, go from a 7 to a 9 is simply going to accumulate less effective reps than what you than you would have otherwise achieved if you had the the intensity of effort constant. So, for example, you had an RPE of 9 across 5 sets, well, you typically, you might get 4 effective reps uh, per set, which is going to be 20 effective reps in total versus if you went from an RPE of 7, 7, 8, Eight, nine, you're only getting, uh, I don't know the maths, I'm not very good at maths, but you're getting what, two, two, uh, three, three, so four, ten, and then you're getting four again, so 14. So you're getting significantly uh, fewer effective reps. So it's going to be very much uh, exercise dependent, and again, it's got to take into consideration the totality of your training program. So if all of your work is done at a high uh, relative intensity or intensity of effort, then you are going to accumulate a lot of fatigue very, very quickly because those effective reps uh, have a higher cost in terms of uh, fatigue and recovery. So this is where you might want to use a consistent uh, intensity of effort on your isolation work where you might do leg extensions or hamstring curls, calf raises, and you might hit an RP of uh, nine, for example. And in terms of drop sets and back off sets, I think this is a lot more useful for uh, your strength athletes or individuals who are using pretty significant uh, and heavy loads on their big lifts, simply because they won't be able to perform uh, a whole lot of work up at those higher intensities, but it might be useful if they need to practice the skill of lifting heavy weights because they're potentially a power lifter or they have strength goals and things like that. But great question, dude. I hope that answered it. And just remember, you need to take into consideration uh, the entire program and just make sure that you don't treat every exercise uh, the same when it comes to loading and progression schemes. Now, next question, another JPS coach asks, how do I find my rear delt MRV? This is Martin. We give him a lot of shit at JPS because he doesn't have any rear delts. He looks more like a turtle. We actually call him Donatello or Farton. Uh, but Mardo, bro, when you don't have rear delts, they don't have an MRV. Hope that answers that one, bro. Question number 11. Are your deload strategies for powerlifters different from the ones you use for physique athletes? This is Mardu and dude, great question. Uh, again, we're going to start with the broad strokes and the principle of fatigue management. So the goal of a deload is to manage fatigue. Many ways you can do this. You can take more rest days, you can drop volume, intensity, uh, there's a whole bunch of things. But again, we just want to manage fatigue to make sure that we maintain fitness and therefore uh, dissipate the fatigue that could potentially interrupt uh, training so that we can resume and continue making progress uh, onwards and upwards in the coming uh, mesocycle. Now, the primary contributor to fatigue is volume and also remembering that not all volume is created equally. So some exercises are gonna be a little bit more fatiguing than others. For example, you know, if you've been squatting, you know, five by five at like 85%, for example, that's a hell of a lot more fatiguing than, you know, five by 10 on a leg extension. Uh, so we need to consider that also when we're looking to, to manipulate fatigue. However, I prefer measuring volume as number of hard working sets per week, uh, just because it's easy and it standardizes things across the board. And there are typically three ways that we can uh, manage fatigue and one is to be proactive. So that is to plan in our deloads every, say, four to five weeks. Um, you know, you might have a four up, one down paradigm. You might have five to one, uh, whatever the case may be, but it's planned in. Now, the drawbacks of this are that it's pretty hard to predict uh, when somebody's going to be fatigued and it doesn't give you much room if somebody's making consistent progress and you just deload for the sake of it, you, you could be wasting time. Uh, on the flip side, you have reactive deloads where you plan uh, the micro cycle or you, know, you just train week to week and keep progressing uh, until you can start to see your performance uh, decrease. So that is, uh, you know, your bar speed slows down, you're simply unable to lift the weights which you were last week and you're feeling beat up, you're not motivated and you know it's your fatigue has exceeded uh, your fitness which means that you can no longer perform at your current uh, you know programmed levels and this is otherwise known as overreaching. So reactive deloads are something I use with my physique athletes 
and with my powerlifters, I'm a little bit more proactive. Now, a third uh, way that we can manage fatigue is autoregulation and you know, simply adjusting loads and volumes based on the individual's preparedness and readiness to train. Um, but again, that's a little bit more advanced and nuanced and outside the uh, context of this question. So to answer your question with my powerlifters, I'm always going to be proactive but open-minded to adjusting as I need, uh, simply because with a powerlifter, we have time constraints that are going to dictate when we need to maximize performance. So what I mean by that is if I have a powerlifter competing in 12 weeks' time, I know that on that day they need to be peaked um, with maximal fitness, minimal fatigue, so they can express performance. And if you want to look into this concept a little further, it's called the fitness and fatigue model. Uh, so basically as we train, we get fitter, but as we get fitter, we also accumulate fatigue. And there will come a point where your fitness and your fatigue meets, and that's where your performance will start to decline and you need to deload. So it's really important uh, for powerlifters to manage uh, the accrual of fatigue and ensuring that they hold fitness um, you know, on that specific day so they can perform at their best and put up a good total. Uh, so I will plan them in for my uh, physique, uh, sorry, my powerlifters, um, and how I structure that is typically a pretty assertive drop in the number of working sets uh, per week and what I'll sometimes do is increase uh, rep ranges uh, so they can give their joints a break, um, obviously because we know the, the big three, a uh, lot of compressive forces in the sagittal plane can lead to overuse injuries and things like that. So it's not a bad idea to uh, give them a spell from uh, the heavier loading zones and things like that. Now with my physique athletes, uh, we have a lot more wiggle room because they don't need to perform uh, or express strength on a specific day. So I, I usually like to be reactive and I program my physique athletes micro cycle to micro cycle. Um, and when we deload, it's going to be movement and muscle group dependent. For example, if I have a client and they're their upper body movements or their chest press and their chest work is absolutely flying, um, but they start to you know become a little bit overreached or things slow down uh, with their lower body, there's no point in deloading their upper body, uh, in my opinion, which is why I'll be reactive and use uh, a little more of a nuanced approach than simply taking a whole week off training. But again, the approach is the same. Pretty assertive reduction in training volume um, and tapering down intensity across the week. So for both... Usually cutting uh, volume by 40 to 50% uh, for the whole week, and then I'll taper intensity down uh, anywhere 10 to 30% uh, across the week. And this is all exercise dependent. And with my physique athletes, as I said, um, highly dependent on whether or not they're progressing in other areas um, because we have a lot more wiggle room. We don't need to perform on a given day. But regardless, deloads every four to eight weeks for intermediates and advanced athletes is a sensible idea to ensure burnout, injury, and plateaus are avoided and your longevity in lifting is maximized. So I hope I answered that one for you, dude. VJ also asks, when designing a training plan and adding compound movements like squats, deads, chest and shoulder press, how do we allocate volume? Good question, simple answer. Accrue the volume for each movement based on whatever the prime mover is. So the primary muscle group contributing to that movement. So for example, in the squats, uh, I would attribute that volume to the quads, not the hamstrings, not the glutes, not the calves, not the core, the quads. Bench press is the chest. Overhead press is the delts. So there's no need to micromanage, you know, synergous muscle groups or anything like that. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, prime movers is where the volume goes. VJ also asks, when changing or modifying the training program, adding more volume, should we do it for an exercise or muscle where we are not able to progress, or should we change other muscles as well? So firstly, don't just add volume for the sake of adding volume. Only add volume if you are recovered, you have time, and your progress has stalled, and there are no other confounding variables. So it's not technical, it's not a lifestyle or recovery issue. Uh, it's simply, you know, you're not getting enough work in to lead to a large adaptation because the more volume we do, the larger the magnitude of adaptation. So sometimes we need to add more volume to get a bigger adaptation so that our fitness increases and we can continue to overload our training. Because remember, we shouldn't overload our training for the sake of it. Um, you know, the adaptations we make are the reason that we have to overload our training. And Brian Miner has a really good quote on that, but I can't remember it for the life of me. Uh, and just remember, 
you know, in terms of uh, modifying the training program when you stall, uh, that's that's a last resort. Uh, again, if you have uh, stalled, sometimes it's simply a recovery issue, and if you're not recovered, you need to look at your lifestyle factors, and whether you're actually doing everything you can to maximize the training program, and if so, and you have actually stalled, it might be time to deload, tweak a few variables such as exercise selection, exercise order, you know, relative intensity, rest tempo, all the variables, uh, but only increase volume when necessary and on the muscle groups that need it. Overshooting things too soon may increase your acute workloads, um, so much so the increase of injury will just skyrocket. So take a look at the acute to chronic workload ratio, pretty good model for predicting uh, injury based on our you know chronic workloads and you know how much of an increase we uh, have in our volume at any given time point, uh, and it can be very much uh, important when discussing uh, adding volume to our training because as Eric Helms has said, every unit of volume is a unit of risk. So we don't want to just be adding volume for the sake of it. We only want to add it when it's absolutely necessary and that is when we're recovered. We have time to do it. There are no other confounding variables such as technique, uh, our lifestyle and nutrition and everything is supporting more volume and then it might be time to add in another set or two. And your question in regards to uh, progressing from beginners to intermediates, how much volume should we increase for different body parts? Again, it depends on your rate of progress. So if you're still progressing, you might not need to add any volume. Uh, if you're recovered and stalled, you might want to add one to three sets per week per muscle group. Uh, but if you're not recovered, you probably need to deload to continue your training program. Question number 14 was from Carol. And he asks, is power building an effective strategy to build muscle during your off-season, or would it be more optimal to incorporate a strength phase during your bulk lasting three plus months? So this is a good question, and I think we need to start discussing what power building is first and foremost. It's a pretty made-up term, uh, popularized by uh, a lot of dual athletes, so competitors competing in both powerlifting and physique. So physique athletes typically uh, go competing powerlifting in their off-season simply because it gives them another goal. Um, it's a good focus that's not physique-related, not scale weight-related typically, and it can help uh, keep them you know, at a reasonable body comp while focusing on performance, which has a lot of benefits just for the mindset um, you know, in periods where they're not uh in a contest prep diet. Uh, but there is definitely utility in incorporating the big three in an off-season for physique competitors. They're great movements, and definitely developing strength in those movements will obviously, uh, over time, help build muscle, provided that uh, you know, you're know you getting in enough volume. But I think spending too long uh, a time period in lower rep ranges with really high intensities could potentially increase the risk of injury um, and diminish the amount of muscle growth that we achieve. So I think doing a strength block for three months with you know really low volumes, high intensities uh, for a physique athlete, not really useful. Uh, but if you're going into a powerlifting prep and you need to drop volume and increase intensity and you know have a lot of specificity in training, then it's definitely necessary. So it's really important to define what your goals are, whether you want to be a good bodybuilder or a good powerlifter, and allocate a lot more time, energy, and resources to whichever one's a priority for you. Uh, but the same goes for powerlifters, including more accessory and isolation work during non-competitive periods can definitely increase muscle mass, and muscle mass is a huge predictor of strength. Uh, so power building, it definitely works, because the bigger you are, the stronger you'll be. Um, it doesn't necessarily go the other way around, but very useful and enjoyable to have an emphasis on lifting and getting strong as opposed to just looking aesthetic and getting large. So I hope I answered that question for you, Carol. The next category is career-related questions. So we had two questions, and these were directed to me personally, so I hope you guys don't mind my answers to these. The first one is, do I enjoy my lifestyle? And can you and do you provide for yourself and your family the lifestyle you want through coaching? Um, yes. Yes, I enjoy it, and yes, I provide for myself uh, and my family uh, through my through my work. So I guess it's yeah necessary to tell you guys what I do. I'm a little bit more than a coach. Um, I obviously run a business. We've got two facilities, and I do a lot more than just coach. I create content. I do presentations. Uh, my job's pretty diverse, uh, but I really, really love it. It's very flexible. Um, you know, my clients 
are freaking awesome. They're absolute legends. They understand my situation, um, in part because I communicate to them and I outline my expectations and what they can expect from me, um, which means that they're pretty accommodating and pliable in terms of working around uh, my manic lifestyle, whether I'm traveling for competitions or my kids are sick and things like that, uh, which gives me a lot of flexibility in the hours and the days that I work, uh, which is which is pretty cool and I'm very fortunate for that. Um, it's really rewarding, which which I love. And because it's something I do enjoy doing, um, you know, the financial side of things is just a bonus. And I'm really lucky that I can provide for my family. Uh, we just got a house, uh, you know, I own a couple of properties, um, you know, I put food on the table, kids go to daycare. Uh, so I guess you could say that I have successfully made a career out of coaching and can provide for the people are near and dear to me, which is, which is awesome. So for sure. But some of the cons and the drawbacks of my job are that it's really time consuming, uh, long days, early mornings, late nights, and you can't ever really switch off. Um, it's a high pressure industry. If you're not out there creating content, doing work, there's someone else out there who is, and I'm pretty competitive by nature and a little bit of a perfectionist. So, um, those two things combined are a recipe for hard work. So that can be really hard on my family, uh, especially when you know I've got competitions on the weekend or interstate, uh, I'm presenting and things like that. Um, you know, I'll gladly work until I'm black and blue in the face, um, which you know has has its benefits to the business um, and in terms of being able to provide for my sta- family. But the lifestyle trade off uh, with that is obviously that I'm not spending the time with the people that uh, I love and care about, which sometimes uh, is necessary, but sometimes, uh, yeah, it can be tough to draw the line in the sand and know, you know, which which purpose you need to serve uh, right now. So very much a case of trade-offs, man, but I hope I answered that question. Second question, also from Dylan, advice for new prep coaches or PTs and what mistakes to avoid whilst building a business and already working full-time with a family. So number one is don't wing it. Um, Have a plan. Budget. How much money do you need to make to uphold your responsibilities to your family um, and determine how many clients you need before you're going to be in a position to transition full-time and find the, the line where you you know that this is the minimum amount of money that I can make um, and this is obviously the maximum that I'll need to be able to you know, achieve the lifestyle that I want. Um, but yeah, you really need to plan it out and make sure that you have a good understanding of your financial situation um, before you transition into coaching full-time. Uh, the second thing is don't expect it to happen uh, overnight. You need a whole ass and you have to work hard and long to build your business, your brand, before you make the leap. So expect some late nights, some early mornings. You're definitely going to have to work around your your current job, your family. It's going to be a really tough, tough ask, man. But I think it's possible. I've seen a lot of coaches do it. And for sure, if you have the support from those around you um, and they understand and they're rooting for you, then you'll be able to make it happen. And the final thing is don't specialize too early. So if you want to work with physique athletes, uh, that's that's a good goal to have. But start broad and ensure you open your coaching slots to anyone who's willing to pay. So if you just want to work with physique athletes, that's a very small portion of the market. Um, And if you don't have an already established name and you're not somebody uh, who has multiple uh, athletes knocking on your door to start, you're going to be up shit creek without a paddle and really, really struggle uh, initially, which is only going to make things harder. So generalize first. Work with anyone and everyone. Be willing to do free work. Start putting your name out there. You know, on your social media. Uh, you know, your branding is really important. You got to walk the walk, talk the talk, all those sorts of things. And then once you've established yourself, you can slowly start to hone in on you know your target demographic and avatar and that niche that you want to be working with. And you can be a little bit more fussy with who you work with. So, that's all the questions that we have for this week. Guys, I really hope uh, my first shot at this Q&A was a success. If it was, make sure you like the video. Love for you to share it with your friends and family or anyone you think uh, might find use in some of the topics discussed and the answers given. And as always, peace, love, and bicep curls. I'll speak to you all next time.